Yeah, thank you, Urosh. Good morning, everyone. I I hear there's a lot of echo on my voice, um, so maybe there will be also some echo on my lecture. Um, unfortunately, I can't be with you. It's my third round of Corona, second round this year. So please be safe. Um, I'm going to focus uh, during my lecture on biomarkers uh, of neurodegenerative diseases. So this will will be a bit of um, clinical overview. Um, I'm not sure how many clinicians are between you, and unfortunately, I can't see you. And so this this will be more or less talk than than discussion. Um, regardless, if there's any question, if there is uh, any comment, uh, maybe you disagree or agree. Um, I my lectures are usually very interactive, so uh, just grab the mic and tell what what is on in your mind. Um, so, okay, I would just like to say that so we got the grant from the Slovenian Research Agency. Um, and uh, for the short introduction, I'm uh, the incidence and prevalence of new degenerative diseases is, is increasing. And uh, most likely this is uh, because the, um, the population in the Western world um, is um, getting older and older. But it is also true that we are also uh, having a better uh, tools to diagnose uh, those diseases. So what, what we actually have as clinicians, and this is where also the neuro, we won't have this without neuroscientists. Um, first of all, we have the better diagnostics. So we have something which is called biomarkers, and biomarkers are um, different um, uh, tests which we use for uh, diagnosing uh, diseases. We can either have the laboratory biomarkers, so we, we do it from the fluid, uh, or we have the neurophysiological biomarkers, uh, or we have the neuroimaging uh, biomarkers. And this all leads to what is the primary goal of uh, medicine for better patient care. Um, just, a, just a quick uh, look on the Mm, on what we uh, what we actually have, uh, what is the epidemiology and the prevalence of the uh, of uh, neurological diseases, uh, and I know that you're all familiar with stroke because it's, there are a lot of uh, articles, there are a lot of um, uh, awareness um, about stroke, how it's important, how fast we have to come to the doctor so we can treat patient with ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke. But what you actually can see here is that the dementia is altogether dementia, of course, Alzheimer's disease, dementia with levy body, frontotemporal uh, dementia, and also the parts of disease. Altogether, it, it counts for 7,000 people per 100,000 inhabitants. And it is more than three times as much as stroke, both together is hemorrhagic and hemorrhagic. And then way down on the, on the list is the Parkinson's disease, which is around 300. Um, and then you have the multiple sclerosis. You will also hear a lot about multiple sclerosis. This is just this is also because of the um, this is also because the, um, there's a lot of research going on, um, and there's a huge amount of money spent uh, for studying and treating the multiple sclerosis. And then we have very rare diseases like amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and Huntington disease, which are very low on the like per hundred thousand or two per hundred thousand. So if we are now focusing on the Alzheimer disease, which is the most common uh, neurodegenerative disease, and it's also the most common dementia. Um, if you don't know nothing about the, uh, the medicine, you, if you don't know nothing about how to diagnose it, um, it, is, it is actually very easy. You, if you have a patient who is 70 or older, and if he or she is having the memory problems. So um, there is a 70% of chance that the, uh, that patient is having the Alzheimer's disease. So how, how did ever, everything start? Um, at the beginning of the uh, previous century, Dr. Alois Alzheimer, he was uh, a German Europe psychiatrist. Uh, at that point, we, still, we were still not sure either we are neurologists or psychiatrists. So there was a, a single a specialty in neuropsychiatry. 
and uh, he was introduced to a, a woman named Augusta Day, uh, and she had a very very strange disease, and that disease was that she was um, uh, she was losing her memory. She was depressed. She also had some neuropsychiatric symptoms. What was peculiar on this disease is that she was younger than what was at the time uh, known to be the um, uh, senile dementia. And um, they knew that if you were uh, your 70 or 80, then it's okay if you're demented because this is normal process. Um, as we will see in the lecture, this is not a normal process and this is the part of the disease. So, the Augusta D died eventually, and uh, Dr. Alice Heisheimer um, uh, dissected her and uh, studied her brain. And he saw that in her brain there is something strange because those, um, there were some uh, inclusion bodies which, which he saw there were some plaques. And then he's, he, because those uh, stained pink, uh, and it was very similar to the um, to the amylid, it called um, it called it amylid. And uh, at the end of his uh, scientific letter, he wrote, "This is a very rare disease, and it is very unlikely that we are going to see it in the future." Hundred years later, hundred years later. We know we are at the brink of epidemic of the dementia. So what is actually happening in the brain? Um, in the brain of the patient with Alzheimer's disease, the amyloid, uh, this is according to the amyloid theory, amyloid is um, getting loaded, uh, is um, formed uh, and it is uh, loaded in the brain because there is uh, some misfold uh, in the amyloid uh, structure. And it cannot; it is not uh, soluble anymore, and the uh, body cannot uh, remove it. At the same um, time, we have the, we have the, um, uh, lesion to the other part of the neurons, and the protein tau is releasing. So amyloid is decreasing in the in the body fluids, while tau is increasing. And for clinician, it's a very important the clinical presentation. And first present and first is the memory. Uh, patients are having problem with the memory. They're, this is their main complaint, and they can have also problem with attention and language. And there are also some other clinical features, which is which are not very important now for this uh, for this um, talk. What is what it is important is that um, by definition uh, of patient uh, of Alzheimer's disease, patient has to have uh, memory impairment, and this is true for eighty percent, and then for the rest of the twenty percent. We have atypical presentations. Um, so, what is the workup for the patients with Alzheimer's disease? First of all, we are we can do the brain MRI because we have to be sure that patients are not having some other rever uh, uh, other dementia. Uh, which and what we are actually looking for are dementias where um, which are reversible. For example, if patient is having a uh, very low amount, a uh, very low level of B12 vitamin or uh, folic acid, they can, or they have problems with their thyroid gland, they can they can present as depressed or demand. And uh, it will be very um, unlucky if we are not recognizing that and we are not treating them. So we pre or another possibility is there's the brain tumor, which could be also present as a dementia. So we, first of all, we need imaging. And, and then on the uh, when we perform the brain, brain MRI, we can see uh, uh, we can evaluate different um, different parameters. One is the global cortical atrophy, which is which you can see here. It goes from <clears throat> completely normal brain to level three, where where you can see a severe uh, atrophy, and there is also a bit of ischemic lesions from uh, side to side. Another very useful uh, evaluation is the hippocampal atrophy, and it's also, mm, and there is something which is called the Shelton score, where, where we simply evaluate the atrophy of the hippocampus. And what we also have to evaluate is that, is there any vascular changes, um, uh, uh, maybe due to stroke, like, like 
uh, see it here, or due to small vessel diseases, uh, which are uh, slow, uh, which are getting slowly occluded, and uh, we have um, more and we can find more and more um, ischemic lesions, but not in the sense of stroke, but in the in the slow progression. So, and there's another scale which is called the Fazeka scale. And um, it has uh, also four levels. So first, in the normal brain, it's, uh, it's has X score zero. And then with a lot of, um, a lot of uh, um, uh, changes in the white, uh, cortical white matter, is a physical score three. Why is this important? Um, if you're going to participate in any clinical trial or if you're going to um, participate in treatment of patients with dementia, um, if patients are having um, a Zika score zero to two, um, we can still consider them that they are having the Alzheimer's disease. Whenever we find the Zika score three, those patients, even if they are having the very low amyloid level, their CSF, they cannot be considered purely Alzheimer's, but it's called the mixed type dementia. On the on the up on the other side, if you, we don't have any other uh, any other uh, Bio positive biomarkers for the Alzheimer's disease. Um, we can't really call those patients um, they are having Alzheimer's, but most probably they are having the vascular type of dementia. Um, very important, um, we, unfortunately, also expensive tool is the PET, uh, PET CT. Um, this is the positron emission tomography CT. Um, we are using different. Uh, uh, biomarkers and one of those by and they are all uh, uh, radioactive. So the the simplest one is the fluor deoxyglucose, uh, where you can uh, see the typical pattern of the on the fluor deoxyglucose. Um, but this is this is all subjective because you need a trained physician usually. And how we are performing that in our center is that um, specialists of the nuclear medicine and as a, as a neurologist are watching, uh, are seeing uh, images together uh, just to make sure that um, we are not over uh, exaggerate the findings. Um, another one is the amylid, uh, and this is non specific. Um, if we find a specific pattern, the sensitivity and specificity is 80%. If not, we are we are uh, having lower, we say possible, and we have to always, uh, we always have to put uh, this into the contest. Then another one, uh, which is already in the clinical practice is the amylid uh, pit, uh, pit CT. Um, this one is quite expensive. If the FDG PET costs around 1,000 euros, uh, amylid uh, PET CT costs to four thousand euros, and the the story goes all around the world that insurance companies are not willing, insurance companies are not willing to pay for that. Why? Because it's uh, it is just um, no, they always claim that if there is no treatment, why we are doing, uh, why we are uh, spending so much money on um, uh, diagnostics, and then we have the tau pet CT. So in, in with amyloid pet CT we are. Actually, uh, uh, we are uh, um, showing where the amylid load is. And the problem with that is also that a lot of old patients, uh, old, old, like more, uh, older than 80 or older than 75, they can have the amylid load in their brain and they don't have the Alzheimer's disease. They are not, not having any, uh, um, any clinical features of having the disease. And then the similar is with the, the tau pet city, but the tau pet city is even more expensive and it's uh, not available in every center. No, it's even rarer than a million pet city. If I just uh, say, uh, say one more thing on the MRI, also changes which you are seeing here, um, they are just the surrogate markers for the Alzheimer's disease because Similar changes with the cortical atrophy you can see in all neurodegenerative diseases. And um, uh, this is not, uh, we cannot pu uh, put our diagnosis on the Alzheimer's disease or dementia on, on, uh, on only one, um, on only one uh, uh, um, diagnostic tool. Um, 
um, now we are coming to the laboratory biomarkers. And in, uh, so for the laboratory biomarkers, we have, we have two options. One is the cerebrospinal fluid and the, the other one are serum. So for the cerebrospinal uh, fluid, what we use is the uh, we are uh, trying to um, measure the level of uh, beta 42 and 40, and then we do the ratio. Then we are searching for the uh, tau protein and for the p-tau. And we have at least, um, there are two major uh, ways how we can do this. Uh, we can analyze it either with ELISA or with uh, ECLIA. Um, with the uh, ECLIA is uh, more standardized. Uh, you can you don't for but for ELISA you need the, because the, you need your own results. You have to because every laboratory um, needs uh, their own curves. And then the from for ELISA you calculate the index, and based on the index you can say uh, if the patient is uh, if the patient is in the. Uh, a safe area like this one, patient number 70, uh, who is not having the Alzheimer's disease, or the patient is um, already in the, um, part, in the part of the disease. Uh, um, then um, with ELISA, uh, again, we are also with the cerebrospinal fluid, we are not 100%. We, we are again around 80 to 90. Um, and then we have the Ecclesia, which is um, which is more standardized, and they are um, um, the results are faster. We don't have to wait so uh, for so many patients. Um, and what we can do is, and this is actually um, no, this is actually now a standard practice, is that then we combine all information what we get from the or from the. Um, uh, biomarkers we use. So it's the, called the ATN classification, where A stands for uh, amyloid, uh, uh, T for phosphorylite tau, and N for neurodegeneration. The N uh, and the neurodegeneration is uh, um, assessed either with uh, tau uh, or FDG PET or uh, MRI. I think I just got a question. Um, I'm. Uh, can we take a question now? Uh, is it possible? I see that someone raised a hand. Um, Uh, yeah, but there was nothing in the chat. I, I just saw there was the raised hand. That that was that was uh, that that's the only thing. Yeah. So whoever raised the hand, please uh, type type the question in the chat, and I'll try to answer it. Okay. Probably yes. Um, because I don't see I don't see all those. Uh, I don't see. I unfortunately I don't see all the participants. So I would I would kindly ask the. Um, uh, assistant for, with this one okay um and i'll i'll go on with my uh, my lecture but when we uh, if there is the question please type it okay so now we come to the serum biomarkers um the and we are all waiting for those serum biomarkers because they are less invasive you can you can imagine that if we are doing the csf analysis so for the cerebrospinal fluid we have to um, admit the patient, uh, we have to stick the needle into his low back. Um, uh, then we are waiting um, and the patient can have more side effects. So serum biomarkers is like for every other uh, blood analysis. Um, and um, it will be probably when, when we will have it, uh, um, when those biomarkers will be available, uh, we are going. Uh, we'll, we'll probably start doing the pre-screenings uh, as we do for the cerebrovascular disease. Um, we can do amyloid beta, tau, and p tau, but they are costly and difficult, and not all not all centers can afford that. Um, but there are also less used biomarkers, and just to get an impression, um, how what is the relationship between all those biomarkers? 
So if we are we are focusing on the in the immune on the immune theory, and where we have the immune plaque, and then we have this uh, microtubules, uh, immune plaques are are causing distress in the brain, and then the the microtubules are getting uh, degenerated and tau is released. And they, the amylid also stimulate the glial cell, which is uh, sending the, um, uh, another um, another uh, biomarkers and so on. And then um, then we have the neuroinflammation process, uh, and which also accelerate the neurodegeneration. So, which biomarkers are actually are actually commercially available? Um, I'm sure that you heard about the neurofilament light chain. Um, the protein and they are very very popular. They uh, they there are many studies in many different diseases about uh, neurofilament light change, uh, but unfortunately they are unspecific and they just show that there is the neuroaxonal damage, and we we could use it only in as an end part of uh, the ATN classification. And similar similar we have the neurogranin and which is the postsynaptic protein. Um, and um, it is also could be the substitute for the tau. Another another biomarkers are the uh, postsynaptic biomarkers, which is um, which are um, involved in the um, calcium regulation, and they could substitute the p tau. Um, and the the level of uh, VLIP one and SNAP twenty five there both increasing levels in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then we have the biomarkers of microglia and astrocyte function. And this is actually very important because this is the new, uh, this is one of the, of the new, uh, um, new aspect of the, of the Alzheimer's disease because um, the, many, many years we were focusing only on the neurodegeneration, but now we are also know that there is a neuroinflammation process and there are three um, proteins which are on microglia, like GEM2, uh, galactin 3 and YKL40, uh, which uh, are the biomarkers of microglia and astrocyte function. Um, and um, they are correlating good with tau, but um, some of those are unspecific. So to sum up uh, Alzheimer's disease, we have a lot of uh, options for diagnosis, and uh, it is uh, mostly the question about um, the price we are going to pay for it. Um, so uh, if you were focusing now on the second most common neurodegenerative disease, it, it is the Parkinson's disease, and it is it is much less common than uh, than uh, um, uh, Alzheimer's disease. However, it is um, there are actually two types. Pathologically, it is the same, but uh, if the patients first start with the motor symptoms uh, like tremor, rigor, and bradykinesia, then we are uh, talking about the Parkinson's disease. And if uh, the memory problems, of course, one year later, we are saying, yes, this is the Parkinson's disease with non-motor symptoms, with memory problems, with dementia. If <coughs> memory problems precedes the motor symptoms. So patients are well, first having the memory disorder, the sleep disorder. So they have, um, they have nightmares. They also have the hallucinations. Um, in that case, we are talking about the dementia with living bodies. And <clears throat> uh, usually the motor symptoms occurs a year later. Um, if, uh, uh, if the pathological background for Alzheimer's disease is amyloid, um, it, uh, for Parkinson's disease and dementia with living body is alpha synuclein. And, and 10 to 15% of all uh, cases are hereditary. Uh, and as I said before, uh, if we are comparing the pathologically the brain of patient uh, who was diagnosed the uh, Parkinson's disease and the one who, who was diagnosed dementia with left body, uh, you can't really uh, see the difference because it's uh, the same disease with two different type of onset. Um, 
what is our workup for Parkinson's uh, disease and uh, 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 the measure of the levy body. Um, we actually don't have a laboratory test in the routine, so we would say, yes, um, we are going to do the CSF analysis, we are going to do the MRI, uh, we are going to do the serum analysis. Um, we um, diagnose uh, and diagnosis is uh, based on clinical science, and then we have the FDG PET CT and the and that scan, um, which are both the indicative biomarkers and then the EEG as the supportive biomarkers. I will expand that a bit later. And just if you are not uh, know if I may um, uh, ask you for a bit of attention on this on on the right part of the slide you will see um, we have a lot of different uh, uh, a lot of different um, mm, radiopharma uh, um, um, substances which we can use for the for the uh, PET CT or for the for the PET scan um, no, and oh, this is the uh, the oh, this is the sample of the FDG PET this is um, um, uh, pattern of the glucose metabolism in patients with Parkinson's disease. But then you can see that everywhere the same part of the brain with a with the dead scan is uh, marked. And this is this is the basal ganglia. This is the this is the reason uh, why patients are having Parkinson's disease because this part of the brain is getting uh, uh, degenerated and the level of the uh, dopamine is decreasing. And with the uh, different types of uh, different types of uh, um, radiopharmaca, we can we can show the metabolism in this part of the brain. Um, so the dead scan is uh, it's called the dopamine response scan, and uh, we can see uh, we can show the difference between the normal and the patients which are having the impairment in this uh, system. Um, you can also see the difference how uh, you know, when patients was off the drug and when he received the L-dopa, so um, they received uh, the, the dopamine and the level increased. Um, and um, the, uh, another uh, problem, but there's the problem because if patients are um, having other um, uh, for example, if they have the multiple system atrophy, which is related to the Parkinson's disease, we cannot really differentiate with that. So with the, the dopamine, uh, with the uh, dead scan, we have to be cautious. We have to put it into the uh, clinical frame because also, you know, for example, cocaine, methadone, alcohol, and heroin, um, they, can, uh, they can influence on the um, dopamine uh, pathways and um, also other drugs which can have an effect on dopamine drugs can have an effect uh, on uh, imaging um, and we can say and we could say that someone is having the Parkinson's disease uh, and, uh, or uh, but he in fact uh, does not have uh, so every image every result has to be put into the clinical frame um, um, another dementia, another uh, another group of dementia is the frontotemporal dementia. Um, of course, uh, historically, mm, the frontotemporal dementia was uh, thought as a single entity. But today we know this. There are many diseases which are having similar clinical uh, presentation, but they are different. They are different. Uh, mm, there are different pathological backgrounds. For example, uh, three major are the tauopathies, uh, FUS, and TDP43. 40% um, of all patients um, are having hereditary forms. And there are two clinical variants. One is the behavioral variant, and the other one is the primary progressive aphasia. Um, for the behavioral variant, if, if, variant you can see here um, a picture of Ineas Gage. Um, this is more than 100 years old. Um, and the best way how to describe, describe the behavioral variant is like the true psychopath from the movies. Um, this poor guy, he was a um, low abiding citizen, 
uh, with the family working on the rail railway, uh, going to the uh, uh, going to the uh, to the um, to their um, uh, to the Sunday 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 service and so, and then he had an accident, and that uh, as you can see this uh, iron rod um, went through his skull, and actually made a lobectomy. So there was no frontal lobe anymore for him. So there was no control of his behavior and he changed. He, he started drinking, gambling, uh, uh, harassing people around. And then he had fights. He got sudoro hematoma and he died. And, but what happened in this case is actually happening in, with patients with the behavioral variant where they are, where they are, um, uh, where they are, um, you uh, really do you have the new degeneration. I see there's another hand. I'll try to to, to... okay. Um Christine Christine, I think I, I allowed you to speak now. So it's uh, if there's a question you can you can you can ask. I see you raise the hand. Christine Christine Schneider. Uh, no, sorry, uh, that was by accident. <laughs> sorry. Okay, okay, okay. N no worries. Okay, so I'll continue with my lecture then. Um, um, so the other the other variant is the primary progression of progressive aphasia, and, <clears throat> and this is the simplest way how you can you can uh, in uh, how you can uh, understand that is when you're learning a foreign language, you you know one word or two words or 10 words and then hundreds and thousands and so on. And for example, you start, uh, <clears throat> first you learn the word for circle and then you go on. And then you say, okay, it's the circle, it's the, it's the plate, it's, uh, it's the cup and so on. But the, the patients with the uh, primary progression of aphasia, they are losing their words. So the typical, the typical situation would be that patient would like something from their family and he would say, please give me that, give me that. What? You know what? Don't, don't, don't play stupid, just give me that. And, and they try to ask him, so what are you wish to have? And he said, give me that circle thing, that circle thing. And that would be probably the plate. Because he cannot, he, his, uh, his vocabulary has shrunken and he cannot explain it very nicely anymore. Um, what we can do for those patients, uh, how, we can, how we are diagnosing them, First of all, we are doing the MRI again, and we can see um, atrophy either in the temporal lobe or the frontal lobe, and then we do the FDG PET CT. We can also do the CSF analysis. Um, if there's the tauopathy, the tau would be high, uh, but if there is for the FUS and TDP 43, it won't be. So uh, we won't have so many, um, so much answers. Uh, what is also important is that we do the, um, we offer, we don't just do it, but we offer uh, genetic testing and genetic consulting. And many patients are actually, uh, or not really, uh, more relatives are interested in that if they, do they have the heritage reform or not. Um, and this, on this slide, you can see a nice uh, comparison between different types of uh, dementia and their and the pattern of the dementia on on the uh, on the FDG pet. And you can see this is the temporal parietal and temporal lobe, which are both affected um, in the patients with the Parkinson disease, uh, with the Alzheimer disease, and then you have the patients with the um, uh, uh, dementia with Levy body, and they are mostly affected in the occipital cortex. And then you have the frontal variant of the uh, um, uh, frontal temporal dementia. So you have this is the you can see the frontal lobe where where the metabolism is decreased, and then you have and then you have the uh, the temporal lobe variant of the frontal temporal dementia, and you can see. In, if you compare that with, uh, for example, here with the Alzheimer disease or either already with the frontal temporal uh, frontal variant, you can see clear difference between both types of dementia. Um, we cannot talk on uh, neurodegeneration 
transmission diseases. We are not mentioned quite for the acute disease. I'm sure that you heard uh, at least for one variant of the Kreutzberg Jakob disease. This is the um, rapidly progressive dementia. Luck uh, unfortunately, it is very rare. It's, uh, it's one case per million. That's uh, approximately. Um, it, is, it is caused by the prion. We have the normal uh, prion protein, but then for, for unknown reason, there's some misfolding. And uh, one prion uh, uh, um, um, and, you, uh, and it's like the zombie apocalypse because when you have when you have the uh, um, the uh, diseases causing uh, uh, form of protein prion protein uh, when it comes uh, to in contact with the normal protein it changes it so now we have two and then. When those two, they find another two, it's already four. And this goes on in the, in exponential uh, situation. And this is the reason why the, you know, why the dementia is, and the disease is progressing so rapidly. Um, I'm sure you heard about the Metcalf disease. And this is actually the variant of the Kreuzfeld type of disease. Uh, but they are not only cows who are having the prion uh, disease, they are also there are also the um, uh, the sheep, um, the minks, uh, deer, um, uh, how uh, the cat. Um, basically, in every in every mammal, you can find uh, uh, protein uh, disease, uh, prion prion disease. Um, however, the only the only uh, prion prion which is uh, which can jump from animal to human is from the cow. That's the only one, or at least that we know it. Um, in the human, we have the sporadic form, and so we have a, a variant, and then we have a lot of rare forms. Um, so what is actually happening is that the prions are making holes in the brain. So it's uh, when you when there's the when there's the analysis of uh, histopathological analysis of the brain, you can see typical changes like it would be. Uh, if you would cut sponge uh, in the middle. So um, how we make the diagnosis, um, definite diagnosis is always post-mortem. In most of the countries, at least in the Western countries, uh, we uh, and Central European countries, um, the quads of the acute disease is the disease. If there is the suspicion, uh, those patients have to go to the autopsy. We have to report that disease. And at the autopsy, they do the standard neuropathological technique, or we they can try they can take the sample of the brain and they use the Western blot uh, confirmed protein uh, protease resistant PRP to pr to prove that there was there is the <clears throat> there is the uh, uh, prime protein um, in the clinic. What we are actually do is that we we analyze the CSF. And we send sample for the protein 1433. This is not um, diagnosed. Uh, this is not 100% accurate. And uh, this, uh, but this is um, it's good enough for as a as a working diagnosis. And uh, uh, if this protein uh, comes back positive, we are treating patient as he or she would have. Uh, um, Another technique is the uh, RT quick. Um, this is this is a very fast technique, and it's like it is very. It's also possible to uh, do sampling uh, uh, from the live patient. Um, and and if you wonder how we are doing the sampling of the central nervous system from the live patient, no, no, it's not. We are not taking the brain biopsy because this would be very invasive, and if we are wrong, we could cause uh, significant damage. But the, the um, but um, <clears throat> cranial nerves are actually part of the central nervous system. And uh, uh, what we can do is that we can reach the olfactory nerve. We put the, um, uh, the probe into the nose. Um, we smear a bit um, olfactory nerve. And then with this, uh, and then we mix the sample 
with a with a normal uh, PRP protein, and uh, which uh, which is marked, uh, we, uh, which is marked, and under the UV light, we can see after fourteen hours or twenty hours, we can see the amount of uh, changed changed proteins, and then we can be sure that uh, if the patient is having or uh, not having the proactive diagnosis. Well, but there are also, however, also this technique is not 100%. The only thing what is 100% is that we do the autopsy. Um, from time to time, when we are doing the CSF analysis for patients with, the, with dementia or with the cognitive impairment, um, we can find a very extremely high tau. And it is always when we, when we find extremely high tau, uh, we always uh, think on uh, quad cell disease because this is very uh, this is uh, also very typical for the quad cell disease uh, and if you remember previous slide where I show you the uh, tau is actually released because of the neurodegeneration and if you can see that patients are having uh, uh, such a, a severe brain damage as in this image here you can you can imagine how much tau is actually released to the CSF. Um, and just to just to get a bit more feeling how is how it is with the Crossfield Jacob disease, I recently had one patient um, and uh, he went from almost normal state to the uh, uh, to his death in two months. Uh, what we also do uh, is uh, we do the MRI and on MRI you can see in the uh, on the special sequencing you can see um, uh, typical changes. Um, we do the FDG PET and for that is typical that there is no clear metabolic metabolic pattern. It's uh, everything is mixed and we also do the EEG and first the the EEG is normal then the EEG is getting changed. And then at some point we see the typical changes is the triphasic wave, and then as the brain, uh, as brain uh, degenerate even more or even further, you will find this encephalopathic pattern. Uh, the last one I would like to speak about is the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. This is more rare. Um, uh, one of the patients who had uh, lat amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is Stephen Hawkins. Um, this is the generation of the motor new, uh, neurons. Um, there are several types of disease, uh, so it is also it is related to the frontotemporal dementia. Um, uh, well, the pathology behind it is similar to the frontotemporal dementia. And um, first, uh, we thought that it is it also uh, on, it only affects the spinal cord, but now we know that in some types it also affects the front lobe. Um, and what we can see here is that it the clinically it presents itself as the upper and lower motor degeneration. What does it mean? Um, uh, lower motor degeneration, this means that uh, we have the atrophies uh, on the muscles, as you can see here in the first dose of the rosos, or here on the, uh, uh, on the, on the scapula. Uh, but for the upper motor neuron degeneration, we, got, we get the brisk reflex, we get plasticity. And for the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, of course, uh, we are uh, performing MRI, um, head and the entire spine, spine, but then we are using the EMG and there are uh, specific criteria um, how we try to find it. Um, if I sum up my lecture, that there are advantages of neuroimaging and neurophysiological methods or uh, the laboratory ones, we go, like we get the quick results. For example, we do the FD, FDG PET and we can immediately know if the patient is having or not having some sort of dementia. Um, they may be non or less invasive than the lab investigations. We, we are not put, we are normally not putting a lot of needles into the patient. They are more patient friendly and we may monitor the dynamic of disease if you remember what I said about uh, the e, uh, repeated EEGs in uh, Patients with Chrysler diagnosis. But there are also the limitations, the price. For, the price is very high for specific uh, um, examinations. There is the radiation. 
uh, they could be uh, uh, we could be biased and uh, in for some cases uh, there could be the long waiting period because um, uh, some resources, especially for the expensive one, they are limited, and there could be more patients than we have uh, than we have uh, an options for diagnosing. Um, I would like to conclude that investigations which we have must be used rational, laboratory in laboratory and uh, other investigations are complementary. So uh, we can't put our diagnosis on the on one. Uh, result and um, as you all know that the great investments in the development of diagnostic methods is needed in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. And is there any questions? The fMRI studies at this point, they're still at the research base. It's not, it's not used in the clinics. Um, because, you know, you have to understand that uh, whatever comes to the clinics, it has to be really 100% or 80% proof. So it, it has to be, it has to be very, very uh, robust. So it is approved for the uh, using the, in the diagnosis. Um, the resting uh, state fMRI has its it all to be low, um, but it, you also have to understand there are different types of networks. You know, we when you say the default default network, you know, um, they are uh, in in the case of the Alzheimer's disease, you have changes in uh, if I if I compare it to the EEG, uh, you have the changes in both in uh, in the current and frequency. Um, and then similar is for the uh, similar is for the multiple sclerosis. And and it may be that the, the, the networks are a bit different in, for example, for the frequencies. They are, they are not the same for every frequency. Um, and we need more data on that. And since you, and as you said, the paper was published in 2017. And um, now we are 2020, and uh, we are still not there with a with the fMRI. Um, what is a lot of where a lot of money goes in is uh, our our PET CT and different types of uh, biomarkers for the PET CT. Um, and um, this is also the reason because if you are doing the PET CT, it is much more simpler. Uh, with the fMRI, you need uh, in the patient who is more um, uh, who is in better condition who can actually cooperate with you. If they if they don't cooperate with you, you won't get the very good results. Um, and um, in the future, 
as, as I see, and this is this is the trend actually, is that um, in United States they, they already have the the therapy against the Alzheimer disease. Let's leave it if it, if it's working and how it's working, but they have it. So now they are now they have to uh, fasten the, their diagnosis. And in Europe, we hope it will come in a year or two. Uh, and it is very possible that when we are going to have a treatment, the, the prices for uh, serum biomarkers will go down. And um, at the end of the day, it's, it, the most important thing is that how much will you pay for the um, for one uh, um, one investigation? Uh, and how good results can you get out of it? And fMRI could be perfect, but still, <clears throat> yeah. In comparison to the in comparison to the serum biomarkers, you won't be able to do so many patients. For example, you spend at least an hour with the patient for the for the uh, for fMRI, w w while you can already examine like sixty patients in a, uh, in one hour with the serum biomarker. But they are there from the scientific point of view, I agree that that's actually a good point. So what we are actually having is, and this is um, in every major major center with the, uh, with good memory clinic is that you need. Um, I'm not talking about the MRI because that's the basics, but you need the FDG PET and uh, preferably you need a milliliter PET, uh, and we can do the milliliter PET in some cases, uh, but this is mostly for the research because it's a bit too expensive. Um, and then uh, what we are doing routinely is the CSF analysis, and uh, we are happy that uh, we have in-house because a lot of a lot of centers are actually doing the CSF uh, analysis, but they are just collecting CSF and sending uh, it out to the bigger centers. And what I'm happy is that our lab is providing us the CSF analysis, and what we are trying to do now is to find to raise money to start doing the serum analysis. Um, that would be something what would uh, really uh, be a big step forward uh, for taking care of our patients. Um, everything else is, unfortunately, I saw a lot of nice things, but uh, uh, it, this is like with the sport cars. You know, you, you, you like it, it, it looks great, but you need a lot of money to have it. <laughs> <laughs> 